Hi everyone. I am so sorry for the delay. Um, gotta love technical difficulties, but my computer was not connecting to the camera. So, uh, so problem is solved. So I'm going to get started with our topic tonight. Thank you uh, for those of you that have been in here waiting patiently. So, um, so as you know, for those of you that have signed up, um, we are talking all about autoimmunity this month. And specifically today, we are talking about autoimmune connective tissue conditions. And uh, I apologize, um, there's gonna be some noise in the background. Everybody's excited that it's finally nice out in New Jersey. But um, as we talk tonight, uh, so we're gonna be touching base on a variety of different um, autoimmune connective tissue disorders like lupus and scleroderma, Osler-Rendu, which is a pretty rare connective tissue disorder, and even just mixed connective tissue disorder. And my goal is, is for you to understand more about the origin of why these different conditions manifest, but also to understand some of the limitations with the testing and even the research as to why you might not really be getting a solution that is outside of just an immunosuppressant. And I'm gonna to talk to you also about some really, really interesting case studies of uh, patients that I've worked with that have had many different root causes when it comes to their autoimmune conditions. And I promise you, it is things that you have never heard before. So, so as we get started, um, I wanna kind of start by just kind of telling you a little bit about myself and uh, a little bit about like who I am and what I do. So overall, um, I'm an integrative medicine physician and one of my most favorite things to do is to help people understand that you don't know what you don't know when it comes to your health because there is so many limitations with the testing that is offered nowadays. And in addition to that, there are many false beliefs, but also uh, misunderstandings to why we potentially get autoimmune conditions or why our health can decline with time. We kind of think that it's really just part of the aging process, but we don't always realize that there can be some very specific foundational reasons why we are not feeling our best. And that's because a lot of the testing that we do on an annual basis like blood work doesn't always reveal the bigger picture. And in addition to that, doctors don't always have enough time to spend with you to piece the puzzle together. So for myself and my practice at Integrative Wellness Group, we have really challenged uh, a lot of what we've been taught about how medicine should be done. And I feel like personally for me, I just found that not a lot of things always made sense. It didn't make sense to me that you just develop an autoimmune condition out of nowhere, that all of a sudden everybody has some type of food intolerance or food allergy. And all of a sudden people are starting to have, you know, vaccine reactions and autism. There are so many things that when I was growing up, were not the normal, were not the common uh, occurrence. And now we have taken a turn for the worst with our health. And now we're having young children with autoimmune conditions. We're having a massive epidemic of things like lupus and scleroderma, and it's just becoming the normal. And we're not necessarily challenging that and saying, well, why, why is this happening? And we have always questioned why. Why does this happen? And why are we being told that there's no cure and there is no reason that all of a sudden one day the immune system just turns on itself? That was something that didn't necessarily feel right to me, which is what kept me on my journey of learning more and more and more. And for those of you listening, you know, you're probably attracted to this topic because either yourself or someone else around you that, you know, is a friend or a loved one is dealing with some type of autoimmune condition like lupus or scleroderma, et cetera. But the thing you have to understand that you're going to learn tonight is that this is not necessarily about the diagnosis. This is about understanding the bigger picture beyond it. Because when I work with someone, it's never that you just have lupus or you just have an autoimmune condition. There are usually other pieces of the puzzle that are all intertwined that are either the cause or a side effect or both. 
So when I, you know, people ask me what I do, I work with a lot of different types of conditions. And because it's not about the condition, it's not about the pathology, it's about what is the foundational reason for why your immune system is not functioning properly? What is the foundational reason why you're so fatigued and you can't sleep and you know you can't think straight? There is always going to be a foundational reason. And I think that this is somewhat refreshing to people and you'll see this more as we continue the conversation. But when I work with my patients, you know, they're so overwhelmed when they come through my doors because at that point, they have so many symptoms. They're like, I'm in pain, I'm achy, I'm tired, but I can't sleep at night and I can't think clearly. And like, I can't even articulate uh, words or or have a co intellectual conversation and they just feel so broken. And when we actually do their testing and I'm able to piece the puzzle together, they're refreshed to know that there's not a million things wrong with them. There's really just one or two foundational reasons as to why they feel the way they do. And there's usually somewhat of a simple way of, of helping them heal and helping them tackle those things. So I'm not going to sit here and say the healing process is sunshine and rainbows, but when you know the root cause, really anything is possible from a healing perspective. So for myself, you know, when I got into this field, I did not get into this field because I was super sick and nobody could help me. I wasn't necessarily someone who was eventually diagnosed with lupus and, you know, found myself deteriorating and then eventually found functional integrative medicine that got me back to health. I actually kind of felt guilty about my story for a very long time because I found that many people in my industry, that was their story. They were super sick and functional, a functional or integrative doctor helped them. For me, what I found uh, was my story was actually almost more relatable to the common public because I was dealing with things that became my normal. I was fatigued, I had brain fog, I was struggling in school, telling myself that I wasn't smart enough for this field. I was, you know, struggling with um, abnormal uh, periods and I was fainting around periods. There were all of these random things that came and went that were just my normal. And I found that to be very fascinating because when I did my testing and it revealed that I really wasn't as healthy as I thought, I realized that I just settled for feeling crappy. And this is the case for so many people because we're being told, oh, this is what happens as you get older, or you're having a conversation with your friends and family now, and everybody's tired, and everyone sleeps like crap, and everybody gets bloated after they eat. And these things are becoming more and more normal because everybody is dealing with them to some capacity. But in reality, none of them are normal, and they're just warning signs of our bodies saying, hey, there's something wrong or there is something developing. And we need to pay better attention to these things because for me, when I started to heal my own body, that was eye-opening because I then was able to sit back and be like, holy crap, I really didn't feel well, but I had no idea because I didn't know any different. And that was something that I really found was valuable to what I bring to my patients because it's not about just settling for feeling a little bit better, you can actually wake up and be excited to, to wake up and you could feel good and sustain energy and not rely on coffee and get a good night's sleep and be happy. You can be all of those things. A lot of us don't even think that that's possible. So I know it's around 7.30. There are tons of things going on in our house right now. But like I said, as we got started, the things I'm going to talk to you about tonight are not your run-of-the-mill information. I'm not going to sit here and tell you everything starts in your gut. I'm not going to sit here and tell you to go on an elimination diet. I'm not going to tell you any of those things. I am going to tell you things that you have never heard before in relation to autoimmune conditions. I'm going to help you understand why you potentially have lupus that you haven't been able to get better from. I can help you understand why maybe the immunosuppressants that you're taking are also not working. So stick with me for at least the next 20 minutes so that you can really 
really get some clarity as to why you feel the way you do, but also know what can be some action steps for you to get on a path to healing. So first and foremost, I always start my webinars with this, is that I want you to know that if you have not been able to get better, it is not your fault. If the medications that you've taken have not helped you, it is not your fault. If you tried to, tried to change your diet and it didn't help you, it's not your fault. If you just tried to research what can I do in conjunction with my medications and you became paralyzed, it's not your fault. There is so much information out there, which is amazing, but at the same time, it's overwhelming and it's confusing. And the most important thing that you need to know is that what you need is completely different than what somebody else needs. I do not care if you and your best friend both have been diagnosed with lupus. Your needs are going to be completely different for what diet you should eat, what supplements you should take, what medication you potentially need, because the root of why that developed is going to be different. So it's not your fault if you have kind of thrown your hands up and said, you know what, I don't even know where to begin, so I'm gonna just quit, because you need be better testing and you need to know your body and what your body needs to be successful at actually getting better. So a foundational principle for understanding everything we're going to talk about tonight is some of you are here because you're like, oh, well, she must be an expert in lupus, scleroderma, mixed connective tissue disorder, etc. I personally feel that always seeking out the specialist in our condition is potentially what gets us to hit roadblocks with our health. And I say this because we are assuming that all of our systems are, are operating separately. We are assuming that our gut is not connected to our brain and our brain is not connected to our heart and our immune system is not connected to our lymph nodes, et cetera. We are assuming that we are a bunch of separate systems that are working independently. And that brings me to the second point of basic physiology. So 90 to 95% of your serotonin, which is your feel-good hormone, it is the hormone that makes you happy. It allows you to experience joy. This is made in your gut. So if you have irritable bowel syndrome or celiac disease or some other type of gut condition, or maybe you just have bloating, and you are also dealing with depression, you're probably seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist that's giving you something to boost your serotonin levels or support your mood. And then you're probably also walking with a working with a gastroenterologist that might be giving you some medication to really um, subdue some of your symptoms. But at the end of the day, that is 100% connected. And it's because most of that serotonin, that feel-good hormone is being made in your gut. So if we try to work with these two things separately, we're not going to necessarily achieve what we're hoping for. Or you're going to need a higher dose of medication, or you're going to need to add another antidepressant, or eventually an anti-anxiety, et cetera, because we're not getting to the root. And that's the beauty of functional integrative medicine, is being able to decipher what is the root. And I'm not going to sit here and say that everybody that has depression has a gut issue. Maybe you truly do have a brain imbalance. But if you do have some type of gut issue and you're dealing with depression, simply by healing your gut, you could potentially boost your serotonin and feel happy again. So one of the big questions that I always get is, why doesn't everybody do what you do? Why doesn't everybody use the types of technologies that you use at IWG? Why doesn't everybody look for the root cause? And one of the biggest things that you have to understand about traditional medical training is that most of the training is on the premise of using chemistry-based testing. So what I mean by that is your most common test that you get on an annual basis is what? It's blood work. So blood work is a chemistry-based test. The other interesting thing about blood work is it's just a snapshot in time. So if I run the same exact panel one week later, chances are 
you will have different results. I'm not gonna say maybe they're polar opposite, but they will be different. So when we're looking always at chemistry, 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 we're looking at chemistry because if you have compromised chemistry, we're going to fix that pathway by manipulating chemistry, AKA that is the foundation of using drugs, medication, pharmacology. Pharmacology is going to manipulate the pathways, the chemistry based paths of the body. So we all know that, you know, medication is a for profit industry. So most of the research and most of the testing that we do is looking for broken chemistry that we can then fix with chemistry, AKA drugs. So when we look beyond that, we actually can dig deeper, figure out if there's other layers and we can actually decipher what is the root cause. And once you understand that information, you can also know that it's not necessarily about this one pill cure or this one size fits all treatment because every single person's body is extremely different. Again, you could have the same diagnosis, but the way that one person needs to be treated versus the other is going to be completely different. I am never... Um, I've never ceased to be amazed because of the way that we test our patients. We actually test their DNA for what types of supplements, herbs, remedies, detox therapies, neurological therapies, what is best for their body. And no two people are alike ever. So when you can get that specific on treatment, that is a game changer because you can see people with the most you know, significant diagnosis like lupus get better in a few months or a few weeks even. And that's really why I get up every day is to be able to see these changes that people never thought were possible. Okay, so let's get into this whole autoimmune talk about connective tissue. So number one, the big question is, is why would the immune system start to attack connective tissue? Better yet, why would it attack certain tissue? So for those of you that are dealing with, say, mixed connective tissue or scleroderma or lupus, you hear about lupus and you read about it and it's scary because they say, well, lupus can affect your joints but it could eventually progress into affecting your organs. So how does it choose? Why? Why does it maybe start in the joints and then go to the organs? Or why does it affect the organs and then go to the joints? Why does it sometimes affect people's cardiovascular system? Why does it sometimes affect people's hands? That's always, this is what I'm talking about when I've always questioned because it doesn't, it doesn't line up to just say, oh, well, some people it's just going to attack their left hand and then other people it's going to attack their gut because connective tissue is your ligaments, it's your tendons, it's your muscles, it's your fascia, it's your organs, like it's your blood vessels. Everything is made of connective tissue. So the point of me asking you this is to get you thinking outside of the box because what is the primary role of our immune system? The primary role of our immune system is going to be to attack foreign invaders. So in attacking foreign invaders, that's gonna be things like bacteria, fungus, mold, parasites, toxins, all different types of chemicals, mold, I said mold, um, but overall, your immune system is designed to protect you from anything that is going to be damaging. So if you have some type of foreign invader that gets into your body and then gets into a specific tissue, which we're gonna elaborate further on, wouldn't it make sense that if the immune system is doing its job, it's coming to the scene of wherever that foreign invader is, and it's trying to attack that foreign invader. But 
if that foreign invader or that bacteria or that fungus is burrowed within a tissue, then unfortunately that tissue is in the line of fire. It is gonna start to have breakdown because of the inflammatory process. Because that's all that an immune system attack is, is an inflammatory cascade. So if you think about it, when your immune system is attacking things, and you are inflamed, that's when all those symptoms kick up. You feel feverish, you feel swollen, you feel tired, you feel like you have a headache, you, you have aches, pains, etc. So then you get diagnosed with your autoimmune condition and they give you an immunosuppressant. So your immunosuppressant shuts down your immune system, aka shuts down the um, uh, inflammatory response, and you feel better. But the thing about it is that you just shut down your immune system from attacking the primary thing that is damaging your tissue. So this is why these immune, autoimmune conditions progress is because you are suppressing the immune system and suppressing the inflammatory response and you're controlling your symptoms, but you are actually perpetuating the root cause, which is a foreign invader that your testing or your doctor has not found yet. So when we talk about why certain tissues, it's because different organisms have an affinity for different tissues. So we're gonna dive into that a little bit more, so I don't wanna jump too far ahead because I have a tendency to do that. So I'm gonna pop in the chat box and just see if anybody. Okay, so no questions yet. Okay, so I wanna tell you a story specifically in relation to what we're talking about here. So we have, um, I have a patient, she came in with fatigue, depression, tons of body aches, um, and then after we did her testing, it turned out that she had lupus presenting in her left hand. So number one, one thing I want you to understand is that she was working um, with a, her primary care physician and she was uh, she had her second child and she was talking all about having a lot of body aches and she was having a lot of joint pain and she was really fatigued. So her physician ran, um, actually ran lupus markers, ran the ANA marker, which uh, is related to lupus and other types of autoimmune conditions, and they all came up negative. So I think it was about four weeks later, she was getting worse. So she came to see me, and she was still experiencing a lot of these body aches. I ran blood work, and then I ran a variety of other tests that we do in-house. And her ANA marker was positive four weeks later. So can I sit here and say that four weeks prior she didn't have lupus? No, she probably did, but the immune system is super resilient. So things can ebb and flow. So when you go to the doctor and you get a positive ANA and then they retest it a couple of weeks later and then it's negative, it's like, oh, I'm in the clear, I don't actually have lupus. That's not the right way to think about that. The right way to think about it is your immune system is still trying. It's still strong enough that it is trying to get back to a place of homeostasis. But if you don't do anything about your current health situation, that will progress to the point that you have full-blown lupus all the time. So it's not about just like, oh, it's negative. <sighs> I'm in the clear. It's your body saying, hey, I'm really trying here, but you need to help me out. So her marker was positive. But the thing about it is that you look at blood work and then the end of the story is, is oh, you have lupus. And, and that's if you don't dig any deeper, it would just be that's the answer. And we need to put you on medication. And that's the end of the story. So because of the way that we look at the body and a lot of the testing that we do, I was able to see where the lupus was manifesting and it was specifically in her left hand. So here's the kicker. Why her left hand? So if this was really just about, um, if this was really just about her in relation to like her joints, then it would be in most of her joints, not just her left hand. 
but there is an emotional tie to the left hand. So left side of the body emotionally is tied to a female figure. In addition to that, when you're dealing with autoimmune manifestations in different parts of the body, this is going to be tied to what are you holding on to? That is the specific emotional tie to the hand. So because of this presenting in this way, I asked her and I said, is there anything specific that is going on with a female figure in your life that you're holding on to? And she kind of broke down and she's like, I'm dealing with a, a big blowout fight that I got into with my mom and I haven't spoke with her for four weeks and it's eating away at me. And I thought that this was just so significant because this is a patient who potentially would have just been deemed a lupus, a lupus case and she would have just been put on this immunosuppressant and been told, you know, this is just the reality of your condition and this is what you need to do to maintain it. But there was a deep, deep emotional connection that she was not necessarily dealing with in that moment. So we helped her to kind of work through some of the things that she was dealing with with her mom. And when we retested her, her ANA, um, we retested it four weeks later and then we tested another eight weeks later and it was completely stable in addition to all of our other testing that we did in-house also did not present with lupus anymore. So the point of me saying this is not that every single person that has this autoimmune condition has an emotional tie, but this is the beauty of digging deeper, asking better questions, and being able to understand that it's not always just about an immune system gone rogue. Um, so I know that there are some questions about the sessions. So we're talking about a combination today of autoimmune uh, connective tissue disorders, and we're going to talk a little bit about the neurological piece as well. So um, with the neurological autoimmune conditions, we're going to also be talking even more about that next week. So feel free if you want to stay with us tonight. Um, also, if you are part of it next week or you just want me to send you the replay, um, we'll be diving a little bit more into um, the autoimmune neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis and pandas and things like that. So definitely feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, I'm definitely happy to touch on it more if you have specific questions. Okay, so all of this talk about connective tissue, you might be thinking, okay, well, what the heck are these foreign invaders that potentially can trigger this? Because again, it's assumed, oh, well, the immune system just goes rogue and starts to attack parts of the body. So it is not limited to these things, but the most, most common uh, organisms that I find that are associated with different, and this includes neurological disorders that are autoimmune, is Lyme disease, specifically triggered by the bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi. The other one being syphilis, which I'm gonna elaborate further on because many people think syphilis is long gone. It is not even something that is um, part of society anymore. And also everybody thinks that it is uh, sexually transmitted, which is also not true. The other one is strep. Yes, the uh, strep that gets into your throat I have found strep in people's knees, in people's um, heart. I found it in women's uterus that are dealing with polyps or uterine fibroids. In addition, the other one associated with autoimmune conditions of the hands, including rheumatoid arthritis, is mold. Okay, so let's elaborate further on this. So when we are talking about Lyme disease, this bacteria called Borrelia, and the other being syphilis. These are two different bacteria that are classified as spirochetes. So think of a spirochete as a corkscrew shaped worm. So what happens is you get infected with either one of these organisms that can come from either a tick bite, a spider bite, a mosquito bite, it could be sexually transmitted. It could be passed down from mom. All of those are possibilities. 
So you get exposed to this bacteria, it moves through your body, and then it finds vulnerable tissue. So if you had a ton of urinary tract infections when you were young, your bladder or urinary tract might be susceptible, vulnerable tissue. If you were a basketball player or a soccer player and you banged up your knees, that could be vulnerable tissue. If you've had constant gut issues most of your life, that can be your susceptible tissue. So it's really a matter of what tissue has been inflamed or damaged. That's where this organism, it's gonna find that tissue, it's going to corkscrew itself into that tissue, and that's gonna be its new home. So this helps you to understand why, when you're doing traditional blood work, you're potentially not finding these things. And it's because it's in your connective tissue. It is not in your blood. These things are burrowed, they're hiding. So you have to use very specific labs and very specific strategies to figure this out. So for those of you that are like, I've been tested for Lyme. They tested it in my blood. That was negative. That test is not good enough. You have to do it in the right way. You need to work with physicians that are Lyme literate that know what they're doing. And syphilis, nobody's testing for syphilis. But the fascinating thing about syphilis is that it is the great imitator of psoriasis. So sometimes it's psoriasis, sometimes it's eczema patches, sometimes it's hives. Syphilis has a huge manifestation in the skin. And syphilis, again, is not going to always be transmitted sexually. This can be passed in many, many different ways. But both of these organisms are spirochetes that corkscrew themselves into connective tissue. And that is one of the primary reasons why you can develop these autoimmune connective tissue disorders. Literally, you're going to have your immune system come to the scene, target the bacteria, and try to kill it off. That is its job. But it will start to create an inflammatory breakdown process in that connective tissue that eventually will cause a positive ANA in your blood work which will then be deemed some type of autoimmune connective tissue disorder. So this is two of the most common that I see. In addition to that, the strep. So for those of you asking about the autoimmune um, neurological disorders, so one of the most fascinating things about strep, it is now being acknowledged, but it is being acknowledged mainly in pediatric cases, in cases like pandas. So pandas is pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric uh, streptococcal disorder. So literally, let's break that down and make it super simple. Strep is getting into the cardiovascular system. It's traveling up to the brain. And then the immune system is coming to the scene to be like, oh my gosh, this is bad. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it but it is then causing an autoimmune inflammatory reaction in the brain. So I commonly see that strep is associated with either autoimmune neurological disorders, but I also see that it is very common in autoimmune um, connective tissue disorders that are affecting the cardiovascular system. So these are people that have potentially had different types of aneurysms or have had strokes or have been diagnosed with antiphospholipid syndrome. These are very, very, very tied to strep because as strep gets into the tonsils, it can get into the lymph, then it gets into the blood, and then it starts to affect the cardiovascular system. And this is not my opinion or new information. If you've ever heard, you ever hear how when kids have strep, the doctors freak out and say, you have to do antibiotics. The reason being is because there is a known condition called rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever is when the strep gets into the heart, and that is very serious. So when you're talking about strep mobilizing and getting into the cardiovascular system, that is actually very common. So unfortunately, when I do my testing, I find that many people have had rheumatic carditis in their past, and now they have random heart palpitations, 
mitral valve prolapse or they have a heart arrhythmia and they get told this and they're like oh well we don't know why you just have that and it's actually because strep has gotten into their pericardium so these infections are not uncommon they are so common but it's more so the question we need to ask is why are some of some people walking around with these infections that are totally benign, no symptoms, functioning fine? And why are some people having such a significant immune reaction? So again, I want you to understand this because I don't want you to sit here and think, oh my gosh, I need to go to a Lyme literate doctor. This sounds like me. And then you get put on these high, high dose antibiotics and you hope for the best because I had Lyme in my system and I technically, I had some um, heart flutters, but I didn't ever develop lupus. I didn't ever have joint pain. I was never bedridden because my immune system was functioning optimally to, to deal with it. So it's why is your immune system reacting so poorly? Is it because of chemical toxicity? Is it because you're mentally and emotionally stressed out? Is it because you don't sleep? Is it because you hate your job? Is it because of all of these other reasons? You have to dig deeper than just saying, I have Lyme disease and that's why I have lupus and I'm just going to take antibiotics and call it a day. It's more to it because Unfortunately, many of the people that I work with went down that road of going on a killing spree and trying to kill, kill, kill all of these infections or bind the mold or kill the strep, and they didn't get better because there were more pieces to the puzzle. So it's very, very significant to understand that it's not just about the infection, it's also about why is your immune system reacting so poorly. So with all of that being said, I want you to understand, you don't know what you don't know. It's impossible for you to know, is there, you know, is your connective tissue compromised because you have mold toxicity? Is it compromised because you potentially have some type of spirochete infection? You will never know these things unless you do better testing. And you also have a physician who's piecing, excuse me, the puzzle together for you. And we need to stop accepting symptoms as our nor new normal or just make peace with oh i have lupus and i just have to manage this for the rest of my life because this is not about bad genes or bad family history this is about your immune system is being triggered by something that someone didn't figure out yet so this was a really um, interesting patient and for those of you that are familiar with one of my mentors, Dr. Klinghart, um, this is something that's honestly being uncovered more in the past two years is uh, this conversation about very specific viruses that compromise the immune system. So for those of you that are here that have been down the road of functional medicine, integrative medicine, and you've been trying that route for your autoimmune condition and you're still not getting better, there is a piece of the puzzle that has not necessarily been acknowledged um, because this is new research and new information. So this specific patient, she came to us, um, I guess about a year ago, and she came in, she's about uh, 48 years old. Um, she had a 10 year history of lupus and she was managing her lupus with Plaquenil, which is an immunosuppressive drug. So we worked with her and she actually did quite well, but I just felt there were so many ups and downs. She would do so well and then all of a sudden she would have a flare and take steps backwards. And then she would do really well and then she would take steps backwards. And for me, I know one of my personal values in my health, which I carry over into how I practice as a physician, is I want to create sustainable changes. I don't want to create a dynamic that my patients have to see me forever and ever and ever because all we're doing is managing their symptoms. My goal is to help my patients resolve the root cause of everything. So with that being said, these ups and downs just kept me questioning, like, what am I missing? What am I missing? And I went to a conference with one of my mentors, Dr. Klinghart, and he was talking about some of the new research 
in relation to retroviruses. So what's interesting about these retroviruses is that one of the known retroviruses is HIV, um, which we all know as being the most immunosuppressive virus that exists that usually is you know, fatal to many people. And I'm not saying that this woman had HIV, but she had something called a retrovirus, which is in the same family. And the thing to understand about this, like this was the most fascinating part to me, is that retroviruses have been part of all of our DNA for thousands of years. But most of the time they have been silenced. So when they become active because of chemical, environmental, emotional stress, then they can become very compromising to the immune system and be a trigger for autoimmune conditions. So my question was, is well, if these viruses are so harmful to our immune system, why, why are they part of our DNA? So what, what came to light is that when females specifically get pregnant, the, you would question, okay, if a female is pregnant and she is essentially growing another human that is foreign to her body, why wouldn't her immune system attack the baby? So one of the reasons is because one of these retroviruses becomes activated during pregnancy to shut down the part of your immune system that would attack the baby. Like how freaking crazy is that? Like that is so crazy to me. That is so freaking fascinating. I am like never, I'm, I'm always so fascinated by the body the more and more that I learn and how amazing and complex that it is. So the point of me telling you this is that these retroviruses serve a purpose at certain times in our life. But because of all of the stress that our bodies are under with all of the Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, the working long hours, burning the candle at both ends, comparison game on social media, living up to everybody's expectations, working in New York City and commuting and, and doing 15, 16 hour days, like these things are activating these retroviruses. And these retroviruses are compromising our immune system and they are not allowing Allowing us to bounce back from just a flu or it's not allowing us to heal even with our efforts from these autoimmune conditions so if you're the person who's tried everything and you've done so much and you've hit a million roadblocks you might be dealing with a retrovirus and there are very simple ways that you can test this to uncover is this part of the puzzle so one of the biggest myths around autoimmune conditions and really just many avenues of, of health is that your testing is always accurate. Uh, for those of you that have been with me the, the full 40 minutes, um, a positive ANA, I have run blood work one week apart. I've seen a positive ANA and then I've seen a negative ANA. ANA is the primary marker that dictates um, if you are potentially developing a autoimmune connective tissue disorder. The other thing that's really fascinating about this is if your ANA is positive and your doctor did the reflex test, then certain things that pop up will indicate, is this scleroderma? Is this... <clears throat> Sjogren's, is this lupus? But what I find fascinating is I will run the blood work and technically the markers will be for lupus, but then as I'm talking to the patient, they're like, but I'm so stiff, I'm so stiff, I can't move, I can't bend my fingers, I'm in so much pain, it's so hard to get out of bed. And I use my, my in-house testing and it reveals that they actually have scleroderma. So you can't always rely just on these blood work markers. You also have to consider what are the symptoms of the patient because your symptoms matter and they do not deserve to be ignored. They 100% are significant because there is limitations with 
any test that you use. That's why through our onboarding process, I use five different types of technology with blood work and I put that all together with your history to understand the bigger picture. I'm not sitting there relying on one test because that is what made me run into roadblocks with my patients in the past. And I have worked very hard to try to evolve my my diagnostic process so that I can understand the route from day one and help put you on the right path as soon as possible. And the other thing too about this infectious disease testing is that if you have been with me the whole time, we talked about how these connective tissue disorders can be tied to strep, they can be tied to Lyme disease, they can be tied to syphilis even. So the infectious disease testing is only being done by infectious disease physicians. Nobody's going to an infectious disease doctor unless you have reoccurring fevers that nobody can figure out or if you have reoccurring diarrhea that's not going away. So a lot of times you're not being tested properly for these infectious diseases. And then in addition, if your doctor is, ooh, let's rule out Lyme disease, your traditional run-of-the-mill Lyme panel through LabCorp and Quest is a crap test. It's not a good test. So it's really a matter of knowing that not all of this testing is always going to give you the whole picture. And this is kind of the example that I gave earlier is I wanted to give you guys a visual because I know this is not always the easiest to process, but looking for Lyme disease. When you're, um, when physicians are looking for Lyme and if they're looking for it through a spinal tap or they're even looking at looking for it through a biopsy, they're always looking for the spirochetes. The spirochetes are I don't know if that actually worked, but the spirochetes are these squiggly things that I circled here. So the thing about the squigglies is that they don't always look like that. So most of the time when you're looking at a biopsy or looking at a spinal tap, the spirochetes, they revert back into what you see on the left circled in the red, which is called a bleb or a round body cyst. So when you're talking about Lyme, um, as a bacteria, it is a tricky, tricky, tricky bacteria. It is very hard to diagnose properly because it changes form depending on where it is in the body. It also hides and burrows itself. So again, it's just reiterating that not always is your testing going to be 100% accurate. So I've kind of talked about this with the case study that I mentioned about the woman with her left hand. So when we're talking about these autoimmune conditions, I have found that emotional ties are so freaking significant. I am so sorry for the noise. But one of the fascinating things about the hands, because lupus um, and scleroderma have a tendency to affect the hands pretty tremendously, and even rheumatoid arthritis. And one of the big ties to that is what are you holding on to? Is there something that you haven't been able to let go? Is there a bad job you're holding on to? Is there a relationship you're holding on to? Is there a grudge that you're holding? The gut, um, this was something really significant that came up not too long ago for me. And it was specifically, um, I was getting weird sensations in my thumb, which is tied to your large intestine. And I also had a rash on my thumb and my pointer finger. And it was only in that area. So when it comes to the thumb and the pointer finger, those are meridians and those meridians are connected. It's the large intestine and the lung. So the lung is about grief and the large intestine is about elimination. So um, one of the uh, Chinese medicine doctors that I was working with is he said, you know, when you're dealing with a large intestine issue, a lot of times is like, what are you not willing to eliminate out of your life? And it was a very interesting, um, uh, or it was very significant to me at that time because I was going through a pretty significant transition personally. And um, there were things that I was really scared of letting go of or, or eliminating out of my life. There was a lot of fear around that. And there was also a little bit of grief around moving on from that. 
So it's just so fascinating that these things pop up at different times, but they can truly affect us from a physiological standpoint. Um, knees and ankles, I know that this is another really, really common area that gets affected when we're dealing with these autoimmune conditions. And knees and ankles has a lot of significance to, you know, what are you fearing um, moving forward from? Or why are you scared of taking that next step? Or what are you scared of walking away from? So it's a very, very interesting thing. And it's not about everybody needing, you know, deep emotional work or talk therapy. This is really just about, um, sometimes it's just acknowledgement, acknowledging that that piece is part of your health puzzle. Some of it is using methods like acupuncture or using um, one of the things that we use that is, uh, is a Chinese medicine meridian based technology is called a bioscan. And some of it is just been balancing out something called your chakras can help you lift the burden of some of these things that you're holding. So it's not, again, necessarily about therapy. It's just about acknowledgement and using different um, methods that are congruent for your body to release these things. So this was specifically a patient. She presented with, I put quote unquote thyroid issues um, because she had a lot of symptoms that many women come to me with that are like, oh, it's my thyroid or it's my hormones. So she was very cold all the time. She had a really cold hands and feet, technically had Raynaud's phenomenon, which is when your hands and feet have really poor circulation. Her hair was falling out. Um, and again, she was like dealing with um, some varicose vein issues. Uh, she definitely knew that her circulatory system wasn't um, working at its best. She was also dealing with some dizziness and some fainting occasionally, not all the time, just occasionally. So with all of this, it's very easy for us females to peg this as hormonal or thyroid related. But in reality, being cold, having varicose veins, being dizzy, fainting, and even hair falling out is all very circulatory. Because if your scalp is not getting proper blood supply, you're going to then have issues with your hair falling out. You might also have headaches or migraines or what you call sinus pressure, which is because your blood flow in and out of your head is not working optimally. So what I find so fascinating is that many women that come to me with their quote unquote hormonal issues, sometimes this ends up being tied back to an autoimmune connective tissue disorder like lupus, but it's affecting their connective tissue of their cardiovascular system. So this can cause all of these symptoms like the cold, um, you know, cold hands and feet, hair falling out, dizziness, et cetera. But more importantly, this creates a susceptibility for you to be at risk for a stroke or for an aneurysm. And I'm just gonna turn this light on. So the really interesting thing about this is that I personally, again, you don't know what you don't know, I was a ticking time bomb. And I ended up having a genetic condition called Takayusu's, um, which is actually has to do with the cardiovascular system. And what it does is it makes your connective tissue more susceptible in your aorta, which is the really big vessel that comes off your heart and goes down into your abdomen. Um, it makes it more susceptible to having um, to tearing and having an aneurysm. So it was just very fascinating because I was having random heart palpitations. I was having random circulatory issues, um, cold hands and feet, like really, really cold feet when I slept. I had to wear socks when I was sleeping, even in the summer. So there were all of these things that were, again, my normal. They were no big deal to me. You know, it was just that's the way my body is. And using the technology that we use in-house, I was able to see that, all of those things were uh, being contributed to because of this genetic predisposition that I had. So I'm saying this to you not because now I'm doomed because that's my genetics. I just now know how to properly take care of my body in order to preserve that system. And one of the ways that I do that is making sure that I do cardiovascular activity like workouts but I also make sure that I keep my lymphatic system very healthy because your lymph 
in your cardiovascular system work hand in hand. So if you're a person that doesn't sweat or you're constantly getting swollen glands, swollen um, limb for ingrown hairs in your armpits, um, if you're also feeling very puffy, very bloated, you have a lot of cellulite, those are all signs that your lymphatic system is not working optimally. So it's very, very significant to, um, to be able to take these symptoms as not being your normal, but the fact that they potentially have a root cause and these are things that you can work on to obviously prevent anything more serious in the future. So the biggest myth of them all is that autoimmunity is irreversible and it has no known cause. So I think at this point you realize that there is going to be a cause. But more importantly is that when you understand the root, anything is possible. I have seen autoimmune markers stabilize. I have seen ANAs become negative and stay negative. And these are things that people never thought were possible. And again, it's not always just about the autoimmune condition or even the infections that are potentially correlated with it. It's about why is your immune system so reactive? Why is it not able to, to deal with the different um, organisms that your body is, is fighting off? Like why is it struggling so much? And this usually comes back to your body's inability to filter the bad stuff out because uh, this is always something that I explain to my patients and like, holy crap, that makes a lot of sense. But we have, our bodies are designed to filter the bad stuff out. Our bodies are designed to deal with toxins, molds, infections, viruses, all of it. But the major systems that get rid of the bad stuff is tonsils, liver, spleen, gallbladder, how many people have fatty liver? How many people get have gut issues or have parts of their colon removed? How many people are missing an appendix? These are significant things. Like these are all of your immune system filtration organs. <clears throat> Excuse me. So instead of us acknowledging, well, why did this become compromised? Or why is this is this organ so overloaded? We just remove them and say, oh, problem is solved. And it's not any of our faults. This is just what we're being told is like, you don't need an appendix. It's a useless organ. That's what I always find so fascinating when we say things are useless. I'm like, well, why would it be built into our body if it's completely useless and serves no purpose? So your appendix is like the primary filter of getting the bad stuff out of your gut. So if your appendix became an appendicitis and ruptured, that's why they say it's deadly if it ruptures because it pours bacteria into your bloodstream and you could die from that. So your appendix very much serves a purpose. You can survive without it. But the bigger understanding is that if your appendix got to the point of an appendicitis, that means your gut is dealing with a boatload of issues. So the point is, is that if you haven't gathered this yet, is that very rarely do things manifest like the textbook. Very rarely is it, you just have lupus and that's the end of the story. There is always going to be more to the story to understand why that developed in your body, why is your immune system being so triggered? And most importantly is if you don't match the textbook, how is your treatment going to match the textbook? It is impossible to think that you're going to get your life back by just shutting down your immune system and calling it a day. There is so much more to be evaluated that can help you truly get to the root cause. So some of you listening might be completely brand new to this whole idea of functional and integrative medicine, and maybe you're here just to learn a little bit more. And then there are some of you that have been down the road of functional medicine and maybe you got some results and hit a plateau, maybe you got no results. The thing I want you to understand about this is that there is the conventional way of looking at the body, which is really based on looking at the chemistry through the blood work and then utilizing tools such as drugs and surgery. And then there's functional medicine that brings in a lot more elaborate testing, which really helps you dig deeper to get to the root cause, but a lot of times functional medicine is really relying on two major tools in the toolbox, diet and supplements. I used to practice that way and I don't practice that way anymore because 
I hit plateaus with it and I found that there were limitations. In addition to that, I didn't want to be on an elimination diet for the rest of my life. And it was very hard for me to advocate that for my patients because I didn't feel that that was really the way that it should be. I, I knew that there was more. I just didn't know it early on in practice. So I kept digging, digging, digging and evolving. And that brought me to integrative medicine. One of my mentors, Dr. Klinghardt, he said to me, don't call yourself integrative if all you do is diet and supplements. And our practice is called Integrative Wellness Group, and it has been since day one. So it really got me thinking and made me realize, okay, we need to, we need to bring more to the table. And that is why we have detoxification therapies. We have lymphatic drainage therapies. We have neurological therapies. We do physical type therapies. We do so many different types of modalities. And it's not that everybody gets all of those things. Every single person gets a customized approach according to their results. And this is what allows us to get results in a short amount of time is because not everybody just needs a supplement regimen. Not everybody needs to be on an elimination diet. Some people really just need detox. Some people just need to work through their, their emotional traumas and they'll feel fine. Everybody is so, so different. So everybody always asks, you know, how does this all work? This all sounds great. Like, does this go through my insurance? You know, all the logistical questions. Well, I really think that healthcare is going in a positive direction because people are demanding more out of their experience. They are demanding more answers. And, you know, we're not 100% there yet. So fortunately, a lot of your blood work and lab testing is gonna go directly through your in-network insurance. But most of the services and the detox therapies are going to be classified as out of network. And it's really like that right now because we choose to serve you instead of serving insurance providers. Insurance providers try to dictate what is medically necessary, which we all know that that never works out in the favor of the, of the patient. Because how are they supposed to know what is best for your body? They're not physicians. They're a for-profit company. So we choose to serve you and to spend time with you to really dig deeper and to be able to give you a plan that is going to give you results. Um, and also most people end up getting their out of network reimbursement as well as using their health savings accounts or even flex savings accounts, which are fantastic. One thing I said, which I got a standing ovation at my last um, speaking engagement was, if you value your health, uh, do not let anyone tell you that you can't invest in it. Obviously, there's always conversations to be had as a family with your spouse and loved ones. But, you know, when it comes to feeling nervous about being judged for spending money on your health or or even just taking a step to take care of yourself instead of taking that money to spend on you know, extracurricular things for your kids. I can't tell you the massive guilt that people feel about that. And I think it is very unfair for us to be programmed to think that we shouldn't take care of ourselves and we shouldn't spend money on our health. Because at the end of the day, if we are healthy and we are preserved, we show up so much better for our loved ones and for our jobs and for our employees if you're a business owner you show up completely differently and you impact people in such a positive way. So don't let anybody tell you that you don't deserve that. And again, healthcare is about answers and solutions. I think that we forget that. I think we settle for just being told, oh, well, we finally figured it out. It's lupus. Here's your drug. Call it a day. And it's really about, well, why? Why do I have this? Where did this come from? How did it, how did it develop? Like, what can I do like, of, with my lifestyle? What can I do beyond just taking a pill? And we deserve those answers and we deserve to know what we can do to help ourselves. So you may be thinking, well, how the heck do they get all this crazy information? Um, so our onboarding process is very unique because we specifically do a variety of different tests and compile all of the information together. 
So we do meridian-based testing, which allows us to know, is there things that are weighing you down emotionally? Are you absorbing tons of bad energy from the people around you, from your job, from your boss? So that is amazing information by looking at that piece of the puzzle. We also look at chemical allergies or chemical sensitivities, environmental allergies, food allergies. Then we look down to the DNA level using the bioresonance. What is going on that's compromising your DNA, that's compromising your cells? Do you have toxins? Do you have infections? Like what's hiding in your body that your conventional tests haven't found? We test for heavy metals, mineral deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies, and my absolute favorite, the autonomic response testing. So this was actually created by Dr. Klinghart. So this has taken all of the guessing out of how we do things. We do not guess, we test. So when it comes to your recommendations that we give to you, Nothing is cookie cutter. Nothing is the lupus protocol, the scleroderma protocol, the, the irritable bowel protocol. Every single thing is tested against your body. So your supplements are tested, your, the herbs, the homeopathics, the detox, neurological therapies, physical therapies, all of these things are tested. And your body tells us, this is good for me to start the healing process. So it's pretty amazing when you're able to walk in with a plan that you know is congruent for what that person's body needs. And that's really something that we pride ourselves on because not many people are doing, well, I don't know if anybody's doing it, but I'm sure maybe somewhere in the world. <laughs> so we do this unique onboarding process because I was really tired of giving people all of these different tests, blood work, stool samples, nasal swabs, saliva tests, hormone tests, and they spend all this money, two, three, four thousand dollars on all these fancy tests, and then still sometimes I wasn't really able to connect the dots. So we've learned, we've grown, we've evolved, we've trained under Russian quantum physicists, we've trained with integrative doctors, we've trained with German physicists, we've trained with biological dentists, we have trained with so many different people, different countries, different professions to collaborate all of these diagnostics under our roof so that we can get you the most accurate answers, number one. Number two is that we can actually save you money on your testing so you can spend money on what's important, which is actually getting better. And also too, like at the end of the day, for you, if you've been searching for years upon years to figure out what can I do? How can I work with this autoimmune condition? What can I do to resolve it? What can I eat? What can I not eat? Depending on you and your goals, what you can achieve with this information is priceless. And you know, there are many people that are new to this and they're like, yeah, this sounds great, but like, whatever, I don't really have that many symptoms. And then there's a lot of people that are like, oh my gosh, where have you been all my life? So I think it's just so invaluable when you're able to truly, truly know what's going on in your body. So everybody always wants to know, how does it work? What does it cost? So um, our onboarding process for all of the tests that I described is 1425. Those of you, again, new to this world might be thinking that is a lot of money, which I totally get. But again, when you go to other types of facilities, a lot of times you're going to be spending maybe three, four, five hundred dollars for your consultation with the doctor. And then after that, you will have to complete a variety of different tests that usually will rack up to about anywhere between, you know, a thousand up to five thousand dollars. So it's important to know the bigger picture behind it because the tests that we are doing are very, very customized, but they also fall under this onboarding fee. Um, but it is very important for us to always make sure that we know that the people that work with us are a good fit for us as well as we are a good fit for them. So this is a direct link if you want to set up time with one of our client services team members to talk to them a little bit more about how it all works and a little bit more about your condition and how we work with, um, work with that condition because we always wanna make sure that we are going to meet your needs and help you achieve your health goals.
Also, if you are long distance, I always should say this earlier, um, you can do all of your testing from a distance. What's amazing about some of the testing that we do is it's DNA based. You have DNA in your hair. So simply by sending us a hair sample, you actually have the ability to do a lot of your testing from a distance. Um, for those of you that are like, that sounds great, but what about care? I really like what you guys are doing from a, a care perspective. We do offer something called immersion weeks. And those immersion weeks are amazing um, because people come and do a morning and afternoon session over the course of six days and get fully immersed into our program um, and walk away really radically changing their health. So I wanna to check to see if there's any questions. I know I checked earlier, it doesn't seem like there were many, um, but definitely feel free to pop them in there as we continue. So I really you know, want you guys to know that this is one of my biggest passions is getting on here and helping you to understand more about these autoimmune conditions and help you to get clarity on things that maybe you've never heard before. And this is truly more of an educational experience, but when you're able to get your testing and know what's going on in your body, that's when this becomes a breakthrough experience because it just allows everything to line up and, and for you to sit back and be like, holy crap, that makes so much sense. And I finally feel empowered and like I have some level of control over my own health because I know that being diagnosed with these autoimmune conditions, saying there's no cure and you know, we don't know why it's, it's very, very disempowering, but I promise you there is always, always a root cause and it, there is always going to be a solution once you know that root cause. So definitely check out our website. Um, if you're looking for more information, if you want to hear any of our podcasts specifically about lupus or Lyme or the connection between the two or scleroderma or other uh, connective tissue disorders, definitely check us out because we have tons and tons of podcasts that I've done about all different topics. Um, and I really hope you enjoyed this uh, tonight. Next week, we are back autoimmune conditions. It's our last module of the month before we go into um, June, which is all about Lyme disease. But um, next week, we're going to be talking about autoimmune neurological conditions. Um, so again, sorry for those of you that were here that were hoping we were talking about that. But um, we will definitely be talking about that next week. So please join us and share this uh, with your friends and family, because it's so important for people to get access to this information. So I thank you guys. And um, I hope to see you next week.